Nibota is here. In our last episode, we breezed through how our example system, based on a volumetric standard, was shaping up if applied to what we know about the Star Citizen universe, and briefly covered a few reasons why a system such as this could really help in creating continuity between different game elements of the universe. We'll spend a little more time on that in this episode, after looking at another way we could go about handling items and components. This is Modularity, Part 6. Let's forget the system for a minute, and see how things might look without it. Without using a system for universal item standardization, we have some other options we're all familiar with. First, we can take a specific hull and create items that have their own attribute values based on that hull. We can create many items for that hull to support that hull, give them their own attributes, and even have the hull's pipelines function uniquely. As we create more items for that hull, it gets more and more complicated to keep them balanced within that specific hull. Anomalies become likely, and then function paths with unintended results can happen. This type of system works well with linear progression. We can just organize the components from worst to best. And now we can use logic to create each tier of items and increase their quality. Eventually this begins to create its own function paths, and once the progression path is established, the goal becomes to achieve this function path the quickest, so game starts getting skipped to get to the point where the game elements are removed. There's also the wasted time and energy in all the parts nobody will use because there's plainly better boots. Another option is to create a system for each hole, where the items specific to that hole are essentially balanced by a hole-specific system. Items have thresholds, and as more items are created, they all obey the same thresholds. So as desired output increases, relative penalties or undesirable attribute values also increase on a similar scale across the board. Now we can create many items for that hole with less fear of unintended function paths, and players are back in the game, designing ships with components to tailor it to their needs. Function paths are created for heat efficiency, power efficiency, lower mass for higher maneuverability, and they can favor a specific function or try to balance many functions. No item is garbage because attribute values obey a system of guidelines. Even anomalies or spectacular items obey these same guidelines as long as the margin of values is controlled within a specific range. Even the highest quality parts might be unfavorable for a good ship design. That's a step up from individually created items, but still a lot of values to manipulate in order to keep items unique and viable. And even with thresholds, item synergy is still relegated to the items made specifically for that hole, and players will have a hard time determining a part's values without some kind of a system for modifying the item's stats, or things done to a part to change its stats. For either of these options, it gets more complicated as we introduce more holes. Now we have to repeat this process for each hole, sort of hand tailoring and doing gymnastics for each hole we attempt to balance within its own function. Now we have to balance each amidst the others. If we start this way, it gets pretty tough to manage in a short amount of time. The nerf and buff wards will rage, lives will be lost. Let's take either of those options and introduce something universal. If each hole has its own sort of system and type of items, universal items will affect different holes to different proportions. Now we have a new balance issue, and have to tweak all of the holes or items so each universal item responds correctly to each hole and its items. Let's focus on that for a minute. If an M50 and an Aurora could have a couple of size 1 lasers, and we put a couple of lasers on the M50, the effect is negligible. If we put a couple of the same lasers on the Aurora, they should have a proportionate effect. So if all of the parts that make up a ship aren't directly related to any other ship, things will get pretty crazy. How would we balance this if the holes weren't consistently related, or played by even slightly different rules or guesstimates? Well, we could add a set of rules to balance interaction of universal items with each hole, so this becomes part of the rules made for this when it's introduced to this. But then we have the problem of when do those rules get applied? At what point does something from the universe become part of this dimension? Granted, this is something that will have to be reconciled anyway, but it creates a lot of really unnecessary consideration and a level of complexity that has no benefit to gameplay. It's just background noise, and complicates all of this to a degree that is difficult to get one's head around. A lot of folks, like me, might enjoy reconciling these things, but it's probably better all around to avoid cryptic if-then calculations in a group of addendums, right? Another quick caveat, remember that these videos are to explain the type of system I do believe CIG is building, and why they are. These little segments are just to support why. Data management is a big deal. The time spent creating a system is insignificant when compared to the time a person could spend running in circles trying to come to a similar conclusion without one. 
By using a universal system for items, we balance ships by dealing solely with the hull's design, which follows a set of rules. We balance all modular items from their own set of rules and standards without having to micromanage all of the relationships between the items. Regardless of aesthetics, every item's attribute values originate from a standard based on its approximate volume and archetype, and can be modified from there within controlled margins that have increasing costs for diminishing benefits, leaving more time and energy to focus on minutiae of the coolest assets, and less time worrying about the nuts and bolts. Now we've reached the crux. What does make this different from this if they're built with the same nuts and bolts. We're going to take a step into a very bad place for a very short amount of time. We're going to loot it, then leave, and hope we never have to go back. We're all familiar with something like this. It has this much space for this, and that's it. We can have a variant of this that has a bigger one of these, and perhaps has modified a few of these other things, but in order to change the ratio of this to this, we have to design a completely new one. Either has only so much space for these, and these, but the ratios go a long way on their own to differentiate this from this, before we even tackle the specifics of this and this. We have to get out of here before any one of us gets trapped comparing these, because they don't. So, for one, we have component ratios determined by the holes. Unique ratios are observed. What is the M50's focus? How does the system support this? The M50's focus is speed maneuverability. Its component allocation, or hull design, supports this. We don't need to create special M50 parts to realize this, and to have an M50 fulfill its role, or niche, when operating in the persistent universe. But let's say the informed ship designer wanted to do exactly that, and this is where the archetype system sort of explodes. The benefits of standard components on an M50 are that standard components are balanced universally. Before adding any other filters, the standard components have even ratios between their products and costs. The component standards are just a starting point, though. If we mobied engines for our M50, we'd find manufacturers first. Let's say we wanted to take advantage of the M50's abundance of output from its twin power plants to get a little more out of its engines. We'd pick our manufacturer, enter our volume threshold, and check some specs on their engines. It looks like supercharged models are right up our alley, so we look at those first. If we were more concerned about maneuverability, we might look to some of Hammer's case board supercharged engines, or maybe a dual bore model. These aren't engines specifically for an M50, they're just engines Hammer designs and manufactures that can be installed on an M50. Modified components get generally worse, but specifically better. Items have technical designations and product names. The product name of an item would typically be consistent with the manufacturer, and is for color, but the technical designation would tell the player what has been done to it. Accidentally, forum conversations become in fiction as one M50 pilot argues you're nuts if you don't drive whole max do soups, while another swears by his cased out chassis cooled rig because he gets in that much tighter on the hairpins, and a time and day is set to race for pinks. Between three manufacturers, an allowance for two modifications and only four types of those, we've just created the possibility for 63 items of a single volume and size. It doubles if we change the size filter, and how many volumes can we have for a single item? Well. How many decimals do we need before the variance is moot? These factory modified items allow the player to tailor a ship design with fine control over component and pipeline synergy. In the example system, if we determine engines in general need an adjustment, we can change the archetype. Scaling, manufacturer modifications, depending on the level of balance needed from universal to local. The hierarchy is clean and efficient, while offering a lot of color and options. If the issue is hull design, we can adjust that too, without necessarily needing to adjust the ship models at all. Remember how we needed to take the time to balance the higher size filters for the Prime 7? It turns out, by following the parabolic for the lower size components, we've pretty much already done what was needed, so I just let them ride. Right into our next episode. True to form, we'll pick up right where we left off and finish finishing the stuff we were aiming to finish this episode. I'd like to thank all of you for your feedback and comments. I don't always respond because I really do spend most of my internets and game time making these. Also, I received some incredible technical feedback, and I can't thank you folks enough for keeping me awake nights figuring out how to emulate it. Truly, it's my joy. And hey, for those of you that went out of your way to get these plugged on ATV, that was pretty cool. As always, thanks for watching. Neb, out.